Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Please stand. We'll begin in prayer. Good evening, everyone, and it's good to have the Institute of Culture here again and to have Father Sabatino. Remember to congratulate him for being recently ordained a priest. Huh? So welcome back. Huh? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We remember all the persons and the intentions that we have promised to pray, and those who suffer for the faith around the world to be strengthened, knowing they've not been forgotten. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Our speaker this evening earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Virginia with a double major in history and Spanish, as well as his Doctor of Jur Jurisprudence degree from the same institution. Uh, Rafael Madden has served in the U.S. Department of Justice since 1991 and became the General Counsel of the Department's Office of Justice Programs in 2001. He is an adjunct instructor of jurisprudence and constitutional law at Christendom College, uh, and he serves on several boards in the area. Most importantly, he's a member of the Board of Directors of the Institute of Catholic Culture, which means that he is one of the few speakers I don't have to pay at the Institute. So please welcome <laughs> Professor Raphael Madden. <laughs> now we know why I get invited. Uh, let's begin. We began with a prayer, but I'd like to begin with a prayer. Um, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that all my thoughts may be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I may love only what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me then, O Holy Spirit that I always may be holy. May the Holy Mother of God ever be our help, and may the divine assistance always be with us. Amen. Amen. Christ reigns, Christ conquers, Christ rules. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are... Our adventure tonight is to discuss something that everybody knows about. Everybody knows that in 1492, Duke William sailed the ocean blue, right? <laughs> um, well, actually, we don't know that. Um, and it's a good thing we don't know that because um, we are talking about something that occurred long before Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Uh, we're talking about one of those odd events in history that kind of live up to their reputation, People will often refer to this or that battle as having been pivotal. Uh, if this hadn't happened, you know, this was the high watermark of the Confederacy. Or after this battle, the American Revolutionary War looked like the, uh, you know, the United States just might have a chance at securing their independence. The Battle of Hastings changed everything. And historically speaking, it changed everything in about a half an hour. Um, 
the world would never be the same after that battle. It's not an exaggeration. Um, in fact, some people, some people in this very room are wearing on their ties uh, a depiction of a tapestry that's, that's several hundred feet long um, uh, that shows the Battle of Hastings, um, a very famous tapestry, the Bayeux Tapestry. Um, but as is usual with me, I, uh, I can't possibly begin in 1066. Uh, because it would be wrong to start something on the day that something starts. Uh, you have to get, you need context. Otherwise, what you end up with is um, a smattering of facts that sail along uh, the, uh, a glassy sea of ignorance. And um, that's not very nice, um, and it's not very helpful. So I want to point out a few things that make this battle significant. I'm going to start with the last days of the Roman Empire, about 600 years before this battle. I'm not going to spend very much time in the Roman Empire, but there's a few things that you need to remember. Number one is that when the Roman Empire in the West began what, you know, depending on how you want to describe it, began its collapse, began its decline... Uh, began its fall, what you have is, on one side of the border, a relatively peaceful, relatively orderly society, relatively well-governed, as those things went at the time, and had been relatively well-governed for about 300 years. And just over on the other side of the border, you didn't have total chaos, But you had a decidedly worse situation. Um, You had all manner of different tribes, mostly Germanic, uh, that were just sort of outside the border. Now, often they would cross in in order to engage in trade and that kind of thing. And when they were being attacked by other Germans on the other side of them, they would often ask if they could come into the Roman Empire for protection. And the Roman Empire often would let them in. Uh, would let them in because in this way uh, it, it could sort of create kind of a buffer group of people who might help to defend. And in fact, that strategy worked fairly well for a while. The German tribes uh, often would, would serve in the Roman army. Uh, often fairly high officers of the Roman army were Germans. Uh, they were either pure Germans or they married into the Romans. And, uh, you know, you have mixed armies of Germans and Romans fighting uh, various people over the years. Well, for a variety of reasons, none of which I'm going to go into tonight, the German tribes eventually sort of, it's not so much that they said we're going to push this whole Roman thing over, but they said, why are we only getting the scraps? We can have a lot more of this meal. And soon, tribes come, without permission, wholesale into the empire. And those tribes have various names that most of us have forgotten. Visigoths were the largest of them, the West Goths. Uh, They settled in the south of France and in Spain. There were almost 600,000 of them. An enormous number to simply dump on top of a country especially since they didn't come as disorganized people. They came with their own institutions, their own king. And when they arrived, they said, hey, all you Roman officials, scram, we're in charge. The Ostrogoths, they took over most of Italy. The Vandals take over, and they didn't have a good reputation, as you might have imagined, because you can understand the way they behaved by a word that we have. Uh, uh, They settled in the south of Spain and then the north of Africa. In fact, Andalusia in the south of Spain is actually Vandalusia. It was the land named after them. And then you have various smaller tribes. Burgundians, hello Burgundy, Um, you know the Helvetians settled in what's now Switzerland. Uh, You have different uh, German tribes that settle all over the place. What's interesting is that those tribes within about a half an hour disappeared. 
how could they just disappear? They disappeared because however large they were, you dump this group of people in the middle of a society that's larger. And, you know, it's a little bit like what happens with many of the, you know, immigrants to the United States. In the first generation, the parents don't speak English very well. And, but in the third generation, the kids don't speak the foreign language very well. You, know, <laughs> you soon disappear. Soon only the f- proper names, you know, the, f- the first names, family names maybe if they had them, or the names of places where they settled. But otherwise, they vanish. They just get absorbed. This happens everywhere. And in fact, you know, how many people in Spain today speak Visigothic? None. Uh, in Spain, they began to speak a version of Latin, which nowadays we call Spanish. The Ostrogoths, early enough, learned Italian, or they, they learned to speak Latin, and eventually we call them Italians. Uh, the same is true everywhere with one fantastic exception. And that one exception is a tribe that lived on the east bank of the Rhine River. The border, the frontier with Rome was the west bank, or was the Rhine, I guess I should say. Those that lived on the east bank of the Rhine River were called the Franks. And in fact, that part of Germany is still called Franconia. The Franks didn't decide to go to Spain or Italy. They just said, they just did one of those hip movements. Shh, move over. And they straddled the Rhine. They took over northern France, but they held on to their local land. Which meant that of all the Germanic tribes that marched over into Rome, they held on to their native language longest. In fact, they held on for 300 years. So much so that the version of Latin that they began to speak in the Frank land was different from all the others and wildly different. You know, Spanish speakers can listen to Italian and they can largely get it. Italians listen to Spaniards and they, yeah, they, they more or less understand. They, on the margins, they don't quite get it, but they, under, they can tell when you're angry. <laughs> but Italians or Spaniards listen to Frenchmen and they have no idea what they said. You know, Latin had seven vowel sounds. Italian has seven vowel sounds. Spanish is five. But the Franks, they kept their German ones when they moved over into France. So French has 14 vowel sounds. And it has those really interesting ones, like E. You're just like, what? E, E, E. <laughs> you know, you watch out, right? I mean, it's, there's weird sounds. Er. That's another one. I'm not, that wasn't rude. That's another French sound. <laughs> uh, who ever heard of that? It's a German sound, but that's the way French people say R. Uh. <laughs> France. And all of that is because those Germans kept speaking German. Now, eventually, they got overwhelmed. There were a lot more Romanized Gauls than there were Franks. But you end up having the north of France be the most linguistically, and this is important, unstable of the successor kingdoms to the Roman Empire in the West, the most linguistically odd. And you have also, though, an interesting, they're the most sophisticated when it comes to government because the Franks didn't have a whole lot to prove. They said, we're boss in this place, as you can tell from the fact that we have all of our estates back here in Germany. So instead of kicking you guys out, you work for us now, okay? And so Roman officials begin to work for the Franks. And they developed a relatively sophisticated governmental system. I say relatively. It was still a breakdown from the imperial system, but it was better than what happened in most of the rest of the empire. Okay. Um, You might say that this today's talk is not a tale of two cities, but a tale of two countries. 
Because at the beginning, at least, until we come to the Battle of Hastings where they, where they meet, uh, we have to run this story on two, on two tracks. One of them is what's going on in England, and the other is what's going on in France, in the north of France. So I've given you some description of uh, the north of France uh, after the collapse of the Roman Empire. The first ruling family is the family that now history knows as the Merovingians. Uh, That family ruled for several hundred years, and then they were succeeded by the Carolingians, the most famous of whom is Charles the Great, Charlemagne, a fearsome, wonderful magnificent warrior uh, who conquered most of Western Europe, a great defender of the Christian faith. Um, Hold that thought. Now let's go to England. The last Roman soldiers leave Britain in 410. And England is then largely defenseless. Now, the people there still were, you know, had their own soldiers. They weren't Roman legions, but they knew how to defend themselves. They spoke Latin. They were Catholics. But over the course of a century, boatloads of Germans, specifically Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. We refer to Anglo-Saxon, right? Angles, Saxons, and Jutes come over from Western Germany and from what's now the Netherlands. And they don't, they don't quite conquer England so much as they cut England off from the rest of the continent. They take over the coast. And so what's left of Romanized Celtic Britain uh, has no access to the rest of the civilized world. And over the course of several centuries, they're slowly sort of strangled. And it's not that the faith disappears, but the faith becomes pushed downward because the Germanic tribes, the Anglo Saxons and Jews, were certainly not Christian, and in some, many of them were anti Christian. Well, St. Augustine is Saint, not, not the St. Augustine of Hippo. Uh, but St. Augustine, later known as St. Augustine of Canterbury, is sent by the Holy Father to go and be the apostle to England. Um, He converts the court of the king of Kent. Don't imagine England as one country. Instead, it was a hundred little, not a hundred, it was a dozen little tiny principalities. And each one of them had a petty king. And so he converts one of them. And from there, missionaries go to the different kingdoms of Anglo-Saxon England. And in some of those, there were terrible persecutions, and there's lots and lots of martyrs. But as we know from Tertullian, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The more Catholic priests they killed, the more Catholic nuns they killed, the more Catholic laymen they killed, the more Catholics there were. And eventually, all of England gets converted. Around about that same time, you begin to see that one of the kingdoms, the kingdom of the West Saxons, we know it as Wessex, the kingdom of the West Saxons becomes more prominent than the others. It's farther away from the eastern coast, and for reasons that I shall tell you in a moment, that meant that they were a little more protected And they eventually acquire hegemony over the other ones. And by around 927 or so, the king of Wessex may be said to be the king of England. Uh, All the other kingdoms had been suppressed, and he basically ruled over all of Anglo-Saxon England. No, it was a very loose rule. There wasn't much of a state machinery to, to speak of. But... Uh, to the extent that there was a king, he was the king. Um, now, let me speak about why it was important that they be a little bit away from the, wet, from the coast. Because both in France and in England, in fact, everywhere in Europe, one of those things happened in history that nobody really can explain very well, but we have the Viking scourge. 
Suddenly, somebody turned on the microwave or something in Scandinavia. Now, I know I'm going to be quoted, but they had, they had microwaves in Scandinavia? They did not have, I'm, they're a very culturally sophisticated people, but they did not have microwaves. But something happened, the water boiled, and you find that the people who live in Denmark, in Sweden, and in Norway suddenly go crazy. That's the technical medical term. (laughs) The ones from Sweden mostly went east. And they basically subjugated the Slavs who lived to the east of them. And they founded a kingdom. We call that kingdom Russia. The word Rus, from which the term Russia comes, is itself a term to describe the kingdom. It's a Swedish word. They went down the rivers of Russia to Byzantium and laid siege to it over and over and over. They never quite succeeded in taking Constantinople, but they took over the east. The Danes, they went to England because, and if I screw this up, it'll show you that I should have been a Swede, hoping that I do this right. Um, There, you see, the, the Swedish Vikings went east, and they went down this way, Russia. The Danes, they didn't have far to go. They said, England's ours, as well as all this coast. They made attack after attack. And by the way, they they were great seamen. And they had very, uh, they had ships that had, uh, they didn't have very big draft. So they could go far into rivers. And, you know, there might be a fort or two on the coast, But deep inside, why? No, who's going to come up the coast? There's no such thing as navies until the Vikings came, and then they sort of burnt everything they saw um, or everything they couldn't carry away. Monastery after monastery, city after city gets destroyed. In fact, one of the litanies of the church was, Oh, Lord, defend us from the Northmen. The Norwegians, they tended to go outside, so they went to Iceland, which is up here. They went to Greenland, which is over here. They eventually went to North America, which is, well, actually, it's right here. Um, uh, So I guess you could say they went to North America, right? But uh, they also went to Ireland. How many of you, if I were to say that there's a last name that begins with Fitz, how many would you uh, would say, oh, my, that's Greek? You'd suspect it's Irish. Well, it's Irish but it's an indication that you're a Viking origin. Okay, because it's a Viking word. It's the Viking word for son of. The Irish used O or Mac, but the the Norwegians used Fitz. Um, And they founded Dublin and Waterford and other cities on the coast. There weren't any cities. They founded them. In fact, Waterford, Vadrefjord, is a Norwegian word. But as long as they're out here, they decided to go into the Mediterranean, and they raped and pillaged and burnt everything they saw there. Um, in, in some, these are lovely, lovely people. Well, the, it's almost as though Western Europe had no defense. You didn't know when they were going to arrive. They, the ships were unbelievably fast. And one of the kings of France, he had an idea. He said to the, one, of the Nor- one of the Viking chieftains, I will give you land here in France, and you can settle there. It's a lot better than Denmark. And I, I, I mean no insult to Denmark, but France is a lot warmer. So he gave him a land which became known as the Land of the Northmen. We call it Normandy. All right? Now, I know you're thinking, wasn't that 1944? No, different, different invasion. Okay, Normandy. He gave them this land. And what's interesting about it is it happens to be, it, it, it controls the opening of the River Seine, which flows through Paris. So the Normans weren't going to let anybody through. That's our land. 
So he had suddenly, he took the most ferocious soldiers in the world and he said, you guard my kingdom. (laughs) And they did. It was a great deal. It was a wonderful bargain. And at that point, then, northern France becomes safe from the Vikings. There's one other thing that happens with the Vikings, and that is that they begin to receive Catholic missionaries. And over the course of about 100 years, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden all convert to the faith. The way it usually happened was they would convert some princess who then would marry a king, and she would basically say to the king, okay, we got to change this. And the kings usually hop to, and that was the end of it. You know, you, there is no resisting a ferocious Catholic woman. Um, uh, I, I say that with all affection, uh, uh, but uh, it, let's just say that it's true. And so, you know, these bearded Vikings who were used to cutting off the heads of any number of people would say, all right, uh, and, you know, how do I get baptized? Now, they were usually savages about it. Okay, if I've got to get baptized, then so does everybody else. Anybody who doesn't get baptized is going to be killed by me personally. Um, which is less pastoral than we might think. Uh, uh, but, you know, it works. Uh, so, you begin, the Normans become great Catholic defenders of the church. That doesn't necessarily mean that their personal morals were excellent, um, as we'll see in a moment. But you begin to see, you know, Catholic England over here, Anglo-Saxon England, when the Danes come over, they settle on this part, and they push the Saxons back. And there's, you know, the border moves this way and that way and this way and that way, and eventually the crown of England itself gets sort of handed off between Anglo-Saxons, the authentic English, and the Danes who had lived there. So to go to, and I hope that I do this right, there, you see, everything's explained. (laughs) What could be simpler? You have here Edgar the Peaceful, he's one of the kings of England. Here you have Swain Forkbeard. He also is a king of England. Swain doesn't sound very English, does it? Um, uh, Swain Forkbeard is king of Denmark. His son, Canute the Great, you may have heard of King Canute. Every so often people talk of him. By the way, they insult him greatly. They say King Canute ordered the tide back and it didn't obey him. He was trying to show, he was a good Catholic, he was trying to show that the king too is subject to the law and the king is not absolute. Take me there, I'll order the tide back. You people who say that I'm absolute, it won't go. He was trying to prove that it won't go at his command. And unfortunately, we who are somewhat ignorant of history now accuse him of having trying to prove, you know, was shocked to discover that the tide didn't respond to him. Um... Nowadays, we probably call him a climate denier or something. But the, um, anyhow, you see, the crown goes back and forth between the English line and the Danish line. Um, Canute was king of Denmark and England and Norway. He married the widow of a king named Ethelred the Unready. Now, Ethelred the Unready, unready does not mean what we think. It does not mean that he was not prepared. It does not mean that he was not a Boy Scout. Unready meant, the the real word in Anglo-Saxon would have been redeless, meaning he did not have reden, he didn't have counsel. So it's Ethelred the poorly advised. He would do what his minister suggested. He reigned for many years, and he often got terrible advice. 
His son was a great general, Edmund Ironside, but he died just shortly after his father. And Ethelred's widow, Emma of Normandy, that's important, the daughter of the Duke of Normandy, Emma, married the person who defeated Ethelred and Edmund in battle, married Canute, and had a son named Hartha Canute. Well, when Canute died, his son Harold Harefoot, Harefoot, because he was as fast as a hare, he ran quickly. Harold Harefoot is king of England, but he dies shortly thereafter. And his son, his, his brother, his half brother, Hartha Canute, becomes king of England. And when he dies, he doesn't have any children. Harold didn't have any children. They had a son, King Swain, who was the king of Norway. He didn't have any children. I don't think he had any children. I don't remember. And the next person, they said, well, you know, Hartha Canute's half-brother, Emma's first husband's son, Edward, is around. And they made him king of England. After all, his father was a king of England. He's known as St. Edward, the confessor. There's a lot of saints around here, by the way, because you'll see over here there's St. Olaf of Norway, um, St. Margaret of Scotland. Um, So we're talking about, oh, uh, I think those are all the saints that I can remember right now on here. King Edmund Ironside, he had a son, Edward, but as you might gather from his name, Edward the Exile. (laughs) During all the years of these kings... He lived in Russia and in Hungary. When Edward the Confessor became king, he invited uh, Edward to come back to England, which he did, and shortly thereafter dropped dead, (laughs) leaving very young children, two daughters and a son. The son is called Edgar the Etheling. Etheling was the term used. It didn't quite mean heir to the throne. It means throne worthy. Someone who was of the royal house who was worthy of being a king. So he was Edgar the Etheling. Anyhow, Edward the Confessor marries a woman named Edith. Edith's father was Godwin, Earl of Wessex. He was a very powerful man. Very, very powerful. He was the most powerful man in England, including the king. It's, uh, while he was alive, he ruled the place. But there are problems in the background. Hartha Canute and his cousin, Magnus the Good of Norway, had agreed that when, when I, if one, either of them died without heirs, the other one would be the heir of the, of, the, of the one who had died. Well, Hartha Canute died without heirs. Magnus died without heirs as well, but his half-brother, Harold, king of Norway, now it says Hardradra, means the hard ruler. Harold of Norway, he said, I am heir of Magnus. And Magnus agreed that, uh, Hartha Canute agreed that Magnus would be his heir if he died without children, which he did. So I'm the heir of the king of England. Now, to be sure, this guy is still alive, but he doesn't have any children. So we'll just wait patiently for him to drop dead. Then I get to be king, says Harold of Norway. As I said, Edward and Edith have no children. It seems that Edward wanted his nephew, Edward the Exile, to be king after him. But when he died, he sort of said, well, if I live long enough, maybe... My young great-nephew will. But when Edward died, Edgar 
was 13 or 14. Now, he claims to be the heir of Edward. He has the best claim to be the heir of Edward, but there's another person, and that is Edward's mother had a brother, and that brother had a son named Robert. Now, equals is the sign that these people use for marriage. You'll notice right here that that's not an equal sign. (laughs) Robert the Magnificent, Duke of Normandy. Uh, Let's just say he spent many, many years, long after his youth, sowing wild oats. And he had a son. An only child, an only son, I should say. And that son was named William. Robert repented of his many sins, and he decided to go on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. He abdicated the throne of Normandy, and he went off to the Holy Land, never to return, leaving his son, William, who was known, and I apologize, but this is what history calls him, called him, known as William the Bastard. Okay? Now, it's... Some people have suspected, I think that's why he wanted to conquer England, because William the Conqueror is so much better sounding than William the Bastard. (laughs) It has often been supposed that one of the reasons the British conquered their empires, because they were in search of a better meal, but, um, uh, and I suppose if that's true, it's at least as good a reason as any for why he wished to conquer England. But what you have is, William says that he has a claim to the throne of England, and you say, well, wait a minute, it's through his mother who was a, you know, a Norman. She didn't have anything to do with England. Yeah, but it was good enough for Canute and for Hartha Canute. So why shouldn't it be good enough for me? During the struggles after the death of Hartha Canute, before Edward became king, he spent some time in Normandy with his relatives. And William later said... Edward promised me that I could be king after him. William's the only witness. Anyway, in 1064, Edward's wife, Queen Edith, she had all these brothers, Swain, Harold, Tostig, Girth, Lefwine, and Wolfnote. I I can't explain that. (laughs) Um, Did I mention that they were Germans? Uh, The, well, English Germans anyway, but the, uh, during this time, in 1064, Harold is on a ship in the English Channel, and he shipwrecks in Normandy. No one knows what he was doing on the ship. I mean, history has forgotten. I don't suppose there was anything malevolent about it, but he did shipwreck in Normandy. And while he was there, he was captured, and he was taken to Duke William. Now, Duke William later said, Harold came to Normandy in order to give me a message from the king that he was honoring his grant of the kingdom of England to me, the crown. He himself delivered it. And he swore an oath on the bones of a saint that he would support my claim to the throne. First and only witness to this, William the Bastard. Okay? Well, on the 5th of January, 1066, St. Edward the Confessor breathes his last. What was then sort of the king's council in England, um, the royal council, uh, met and they said, Harold Godwinson, we declare to be king of England. And that very day, he's crowned in Westminster Abbey. Immediately, Harold of Norway, William the Conqueror, I'll say, oh no. And they begin to assemble an army or armies 
to invade England and take the throne. Harold believes that the greatest threat comes from Normandy. And the reason for that is that Normandy is so close. This is a long way. And if you go here, you still have to go far to get down to London. If you don't have London, you don't have anything. But this is going to be real easy. So he assembles the largest army in living memory in uh, England. And I'm going to go to one more map. He assembles the largest, this is the green map for those who, uh, uh, the green map that's just of England and Wales for those who are online. The largest army in English history that had ever been assembled. He assembles and he goes down to here, to the Isle of Wight, to wait for an expected invasion from Normandy. He waits through July, he waits through August, and nobody comes. Now, let's talk a little bit about the army. His army was one of the most disciplined in Europe. The English state was very, very small. He had sort of a palace guard that he called the house carls. The house carls were a professional, disciplined unit that protected the palace and served as sort of the officer corps for his army. But then the rest is what we might call a militia. At the time, they called it a feud. Um, I, if I'm, I'm not sure of this, but I suspect that it has something to do with the word fear. And what these were were basically farmers, villagers, who would show up and fight for the king. Um, but, of course, they have day jobs, right? They have to plant and harvest and do other things or else there's not going to be any food next year. <coughs> Nonetheless, it was an army that would, could be summoned relatively quickly and at not a great cost. They were very loyal to him, the feared men. He has them on the coast, as I said, for several months, waiting and waiting and waiting. What's happening in, 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 uh, in Normandy? He doesn't know. Finally, on the 8th of September, his men are getting restless. If we don't bring in our crops, you know, we're not going to have any harvest for next year. or We're not going to have anything to eat over the winter, and we won't be able to survive. So with great reluctance, on the 8th of September, he sends the army home, and he returns from the Isle of Wight to London. On that same exact day, the 8th of September, from Denmark, King Harold lands here at the River Tyne. And he lands, and it turns out that with him is Harold's own brother, Tostig. Tostig had been a rapa- rapacious earl. We'll go back to Tostig. He had been given an earldom. And he had taxed his people severely, and they had rebelled against him, and Harold had removed him from office, and he resented it. So when King Harold of of Denmark said that he was going to come over to attack, uh, uh, Tostig said, I'm with you. And they land here. Harold has two of his brother-in-laws, his his brothers-in-law, his wife's brothers, Edwin and Morcar. I love these names. They, um, Edwin's fine. Morcar, a little more difficult to swallow. Um, they go up, and just outside of the city of York, they lose in pitched battle against the Viking army under the king of, of Denmark and Tostig. The battle is called the Battle of Fulford. That was the 20th of September. And at that point, the king of of Denmark says, all I need to do is to take the city of York, which was a great fortress. But Harold, from London, marched 187 miles in four days with an army of 7,000 men on foot. He did not have cavalry 
They were all infantry, and they had their kit with them. Well, the Viking army didn't expect that there would be another army there quite when they got there. The battle that was fought is called the Battle of Stamford Bridge on the 25th of September. Four days after the defeat at Fulford, Stamford Bridge, Bridge, the 25th of September, the two armies clash. There's two little vignettes from that battle that I think are worth mentioning. At one point, a man came on a pony um, under a flag of parley. Okay, and he goes up to the to Harold of Norway, uh, Harold of Denmark, and Tostig, and he said, "We will restore your earldom to you if you betray Harold of Denmark." And Tostig says, "And what will be given to Harold of Denmark?" And the answer was. Six feet of ground, or as much as he needs, for he is a tall man. (laughs) Well, Tostig rejects it, and the horseman turns away and goes back. And Harold says, he was a fine-looking knight. Who is he? And he said, my brother Harold. It was the king, Harold Godwinson. Um, Another thing about that battle is... Uh, there was a tiny little bridge. We call it, well, Stamford Bridge. Um, a tiny little bridge right there over the river. And there was an immense Danish Viking in the middle of it. And you could only ha- one person alone could cross. And he, with a double-headed axe, was basically mowing down every one of the Saxons who crossed over. Harold asked, is there no one who can, who can stop this? And one peasant said, yes. And he immediately jumped into the water. He said, I need only a spear. And he jumped into the water. He went under the bridge and pushed up. (laughs) And that was the end of the Viking. (laughs) Ouch! Harold, the battle was ferocious. There were 300 Viking longships that came over from Denmark. 24 returned to Denmark. In any event, 25th of September, Harold rests for a moment. Meanwhile, in the south, on the 12th of September, William leaves Normandy. But... There was a terrible storm in the channel, and they were blown back onto the Norman coast. On the 27th of September, two days after Stamford Bridge, um, he, he leaves port once again, and on the 28th, he lands at Pevensey in East Sussex. He marches inland and takes over a little town called Hastings and begins to put put together a palisade around it in order to defend. Harold, five days later, receives word. He's resting after the terrible battle at Stamford Bridge, and he hears not only that William has landed, he'd he'd hoped to prevent the landing, because that's when the troops are uh, are most vulnerable. He had hoped to prevent the landing. But he hears he's landed, and what's more, he is beginning to ravage the countryside. And Harold, who is a very patriotic man, is ravaging my people. So Harold marches on foot with his army that had just gone through a horrible battle uh, back to London. By the way, on the, on the, w- William had landed with about 2,000 cavalry, about 1,000 archers, and about 3,000 infantry. Uh, they had come in approximately 700 boats. Now, um, uh, Norman historians of the period said that he had come with over 10,000 boats. Uh, there weren't 10,000 boats in the universe at the time. Uh, <laughs> In fact, most people didn't have 10,000 boats in their dreams. Um, 
but it's estimated that it was approximately 700 boats. Harold, who had heard on the 25th of September, he leads, his, he leads about 7,000 men down from York uh, to London. He gets to London on the 5th of October, and he was advised to wait for fresh men because they had sent word out to have the feared feardsmen come in but he has, receives word on the same day that yet more villages have been burnt. Now, of course, William is trying to provoke him to attack early, before he was ready, because, of course, Harold could draw on the whole kingdom. Harold, unfortunately for him, took the bait. Against, his brother, against the advice of two of his brothers, he marched south. So over the course of seven days he marched his army 240 miles. On the 12th of October, he leaves London. On the 13th of October, he sets up camp near Hastings, and they have a parley. Um, The parley doesn't go well. But uh, William says, oh, they've camped at a place that is not advantageous. I'll be able to pounce on them tomorrow morning. You couldn't fight at night. You wouldn't know whom you were fighting. You can't see anything. When he wakes up in the morning, Harold has taken position on top of a hill. He's moved his army in the middle of the night. On the 14th, he had moved his troops to an excellent position on a hilltop, and the hilltop blocked the road leading from Hastings to London. And his job, his goal was simply to block William from moving until such time as his reinforcements could come because they should be coming at any time. First of all, some stragglers who couldn't keep up the pace down from York, and second of all, the Fjord. At 9 o'clock, or let me discuss a little bit the, the different weapons or, or the different military um, advantages that each side had. The English were defending their homeland. That's, you know, people who are defending their own territory are likely to be fighting harder than people who are attacking another one. Of course, on the Norman side, uh, William had said, I'm going to give you guys the whole country. Look at how sweet it is. And you can have all of it. So a certain amount of greed entered entered into it. Another thing is this. William had, was very clever. He told, he sent messengers to the Holy Father in Rome, to Pope Alexander II, and he had said, Harold Godwinson swore an oath on the bones of a martyr that he would support. He's an oath breaker. And the Pope had said, if he's an oath breaker, then I will excommunicate him, and you may depose him. Uh, the Pope, I think, acted somewhat precipitously, um, but he was able to say to his men, we are acting on the Pope's orders to destroy this oathbreaker. He may have been an oathbreaker, but we only have William's word for it. The Norman, excuse me, the Saxons had uh, they build they would build what they call shield walls. They had very long shields, and they would surround basically units of men with these shields, and they put them over the top. The uh, Alexander the Great used a similar tactic himself with the phalanx, but they didn't use it aggressively. They would they, this way they could stop people from getting near them, and uh, they would wait until you were exhausted. Then they'd come out. His housecarls and his thanes, his officers, if you will, uh, they were very disciplined soldiers. The fjordsmen weren't so disciplined. Now, they were trained in the use of axes and that kind of thing, but they weren't disciplined as in terms of military engagement, in terms of operating as a unit. And since there were almost no horses, because the English just didn't use horses for war. It's interesting what happens. I mean, in Ireland, they didn't use horses for war. They used dogs for war. Um, They used hounds uh, for war. Uh, But in England, they didn't use horses. So when the Normans show up, their their officers are able to see better what's going on and to get ahead of the men who are running in that direction and say, no, 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 it's over here, not over there. The, The English don't have such control over their men. 
The English used spears and double-headed axes. The Normans used swords, and they had archers, which the English had none of. The battle begins at 9 o'clock in the morning. You always had to wait until everybody had had breakfast and there was light uh, because they weren't going to get any meals during the day. And you also, the battle was going to be over by, by sundown because you couldn't keep going afterwards. Everybody had to stop. And you'd wait until the next morning. It's just, that's what happened. Uh, it seems weird to us. But, I mean, imagine if I were to say, okay, you can continue fighting, but I have to put a blindfold on you. No, you won't continue fighting. You might be shooting your own men, right? I mean, you, you wouldn't do that. So, Harold, by placing his soldiers on top of this hill, uh, what, no, what William had hoped to do was to send arrow, you know, bowmen, see if he could kill some of the people inside the shield wall, and then send his cavalry up and attempt to push through the shield wall. But the horses were tired by the time they got up the hill, and they weren't moving very fast, and the shield wall didn't break. What's more, the Normans had thought of using horses, but hadn't thought of of, um, giving the horses armor. So very soon the English said, wait a minute, this spear is just as good against a horse as against a man. And though, by the way, the Normans also trained their horses to bite and kick. Um, Their horses actually fought. But what they would do is by (laughs) sending the spear through the horse, the Norman soldier would fall to the ground and then would be pinned on the ground. He couldn't get up because of his armor. The the British were much less heavily armored, uh, but they were far better at um, regrouping. Well, attack after attack after attack by the Normans and the English hold on, hold on, hold on. At one point, the Breton, certain Breton mercenaries of uh, the Normans uh, look like they're about to break through, but they don't and the the English had had their spears waiting, and they attacked them with the spears, and the Bretons fled down the hill in terror. And what happened? The British, the English feardmen said, ha ha, they're running! And they broke the shield wall and started running after them. The Bretons ran down into a swampy area. The feardmen weren't from that area. And the Norman cavalry sent by William cut them to pieces. But this caused William to change his tactics. He begins a series of attacks and then look like we're running in terror. And four or five times the English feardmen fell for it and broke their shield wall. They broke their discipline and they ran after them. And then they would be attacked by the Norman cavalry. One thing, in, during one of these, William fell from his horse and the Norman army said, the Duke is dead. Um, and, you know, so they all stopped fighting because the last thing you want is for your general just to be killed and you're in foreign soil. Mm, not going to go well for you. Um, he gets some men to help him onto his horse. And although he had been injured, Uh, He made sure that everyone saw him. He took off his helmet to make sure that everyone saw who he was. And, uh, you know, there's cheers for the Duke from the Normans, and they continue fighting. Well, after nine hours, medieval, medieval battles lasted two hours or three hours. You know, you see them, you see these rapier thrusts back and forth in Hollywood movies. Hollywood movies will give you history, um, and it's true if you understand that lies are true, um, because Hollywood history is the same as no history at all, okay? It's, it, I mean, if they were to, t- you know, a movie about Abraham Lincoln, you could say, well, Lincoln is a last name that's used in the United States, okay? That much is probably true, um, but after that, all bets are off. Um, uh, in this particular case, what you have is the the English, if they could hold on until the next day, it was likely that they would have reinforcements. 
you know, at this point, William would begin to calculate the reinforcements are going to come any time. Should I just leave now while I still have my life? It was about a half an hour before sunset. They couldn't continue fighting after that. He puts his men together. One last try. Cavalry in front, infantry behind, one column. And he tells his bowmen, fire up. Not uphill at the shields, but up so that the arrows will come down like rain inside the shield wall. Which they do. And one arrow hits Harold Godwinson in the eye. And the same dismay that had hit the Norman troops now hit the English troops. The feared men begin to run as the Northmen, as the Normans attack. The house carls die, most of them, defending the king. The king's two brothers die. Uh, right there on the field of battle, King Harold's body is cut into several pieces. Let's just say it was dreadful. And suddenly, against all odds, William had won. Back in London, when word reached them that Harold had been killed, Edward the Etheling was immediately proclaimed king. But he was 14. And there's now this foreign army on the on soil that had just killed the actual king. Reinforcements begin to come from Normandy. And William goes from city to city and says, you can surrender or I can burn you to the ground. You choose. Now they could say, well, we'll wait for the English troops to come get us. English troops led by a 14-year-old boy. English troops that didn't have any generals anymore. All the house carls were killed. Most of the officer corps had been killed in the battle. One by one, the cities offer their submission. And finally, on December 25th, London, which has submitted a few days before to William, uh, receives him in a formal procession, and he's crowned in Westminster Abbey of 1066. Over the course of the next four years, he essentially mops up the opposition to his rule. And now let me talk about what the consequences of all this were. The same thing that had happened with the Franks, where the Franks kept their home territory, but then straddled it, and therefore, you know, pulled in from the other side while they were subduing this part, happened with the Normans. If you recall, there's Normandy. All those grand magnates, all those officers, all those noblemen, they kept their land. But they now had other lands in England. They sent their sons and daughters back and forth for centuries. The English language as a written language all but disappears. As a written language almost completely disappears. There's very, very, very few examples of anything written in English for about 200 years. The courts, they would speak in Latin or in French. How many times? Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. French. You know, what do you do when you're trying to get a jury together? It's the process called voir dire. All right? These are all French words. The language of literature was essentially French, which is why... Now, what happens? By the way, just as when you had... The Latin that was spoken by the Franks after 300 years was sort of a Germanized Latin, what we call French. Well, the English that's spoken by the English after about two or 300 years of this continuous back and forth thing of the, Rome, of the Normans becomes very Frenchified, so much so that to this day, about 60% of the words in English are Latin-based, not German-based, and English is a Germanic language, and most of those are through French. English doesn't have seven vowels that, that Latin has. It doesn't have the 14 vowels that German has. English has 39 vowel sounds. Okay, it's why it's so difficult for non-English speakers to learn English. You know, bit, bite, butt, beat, boat. You know, all those are different vowels. You know, they're spelt with five symbols, but that's hardly their sounds. 
um, we have a mix of words for the same thing. Uh, you see a pig in Spanish, you say, puerco. You see, it, you see the, the dish on the table, puerco, right? Same thing. But in English, it's pig is the live, gross farm animal that Saxons would have been attending to, pork is the French word for what's on the table, and that would have been eaten by the Normans inside. Cows are the kind of gross things that need to be milked and fed and cleaned off. Beef, beef, is what we eat. The same is true even of things like sheep or lamb and mutton. The only thing is mutton is kind of like tough lamb, right? And that's because they also use sheep for wool. So but they didn't usually kill it until after it had gotten quite old. And so the, but it was still, what you ate at the table has the French word. Um, this sort of thing happens all over the language. Society becomes extremely stratified in, in England in a way that it had never been before. Yes, there was a noble warrior class. Um, but it was just basically one level below the king. And then you had the people. Normandy was the most feudally organized society in Europe, which meant that the king or the duke of Normandy would give out a certain amount of land to high tenants, feudal tenants. Those people would be responsible for providing a certain number of men to him for, for, for his wars. They, in turn, got to rule over certain land. And if the land was very large, they had subtenants beneath them and tub-tenants beneath them, all of them performing all manner of duties to the people above them. You begin to have a very hierarchically organized, stratified society. Robin Hood, Robin of Loxley, a Saxon, against the Norman uh, sheriff of Nottingham. Uh, you begin to have this Normans this way, Saxons that way, Sort of, a, sort of a division in Britain. They did a study a few years ago. French last names in England, the people who have them, to this day, approximately 15% higher income than people who have Saxon last names in England. A mere 1,000 years later. You know, it's almost amazing. England, from being an outlier, becomes an integral part of Western Europe because the people who rule England have all kinds of interest in France. And what you have then is, for the first time, a completely changed English society, completely integrated into Western Europe, something that had not existed before and which would forever change the course of history. Thank you. Uh, professor, what was the significance of the Norman conquest for the church in England? The significance is something that developed slowly. Uh, the English hierarchy was perfectly faithful uh, to the church and the Holy Father, so it isn't as though we're talking about having corrected problems of church discipline or anything like that. It was a perfectly faithful national hierarchy. But the creation of a powerful English king alters, if you will, in... Uh, myriad ways, I hate to use terms like balance of power when we're talking about uh, ch the church, but if you will, it's not for nothing that you have a fairly highly developed feudal kingdom uh, with a highly developed, excuse me, a, a kingdom with a highly developed feudal structure. The king becomes a, an especially important figure uh, in uh, England and that's not at all insignificant when you end up years, centuries later with Henry. Uh, you find that over time the English kings begin to meddle often in the, in the English church. 
And the English church can only do so much to resist this powerful king. And it's the feudal structure that is imported from Normandy and planted and blooms uh, vigorously in England that alters conditions in Britain forever. Um, Now, uh, the feudal system, this isn't a result of the Norman conquest, but the feudal system in many ways affected uh, the church itself. Uh, You find that canon law develops because it was important to regulate precisely who did what and who wasn't supposed to do what kinds of things and when in a feudal system. There's a lot more uh, go with the flow in in Anglo-Saxon England. Things are much more military after that. And so you have, there's the primate of all England, who's the Archbishop of Canary, the primate of England, who is the Archbishop of York, the two provinces, each one of them has within them, you know, various bishops, the, the subdivision, 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 archdeaconries, everything becomes, it's a mirror of what's going on in civil life, with civil society, where you have, and I'm, I'm now, this is anachronistic, but you have, you know, dukes, marquises, earls, uh, viscounts, and barons, all the way down, a very stratified a uh, very tightly organized society. Well, that splashes over into the church in England. Professor, a question coming in online from Marianne asks if there's a particular book or author that you would uh, recommend regarding on the Battle of Hastings or even the general time period. Well, there are, there are many, but I suppose that an excellent place to start would be Warren Carroll's histories of, of Christendom. Uh, in particular leading up to the period of the Catholic and Protestant Reformations um, from classical antiquity and from uh, biblical times all the way through the high Middle Ages. Those, those books are um, Catholic history with all the flags flying, and uh, they're, they're wonderful to read. And I think that they, they certainly will give you a good background. Uh, after the Normans... Uh made a big audit for taxation uh, and presumably started collecting. What was the effect of the common man, like a peasant, uh, um, a tradesman? What what was the effect on their lives personally? Did they experience hardships, or did things pretty much go on as you know the same, or, or how did that work? Am, am I actually listening to the question, after somebody set up a system of efficient taxation, did people suffer? Was that the question? <laughs> Um, uh, the, he's referring to something called the Domesday Book or the Doomsday Book. Uh, what uh, England, what the king's officers did is they went to every single solitary square inch of land in England. They surveyed it. They divided the entire country up into manors. And there was somebody in charge of every manor. The manors were grouped into larger uh, groups and then larger and larger until you got to the king himself. It was written for taxation purposes. It's a wonderful historical document because it gives you a very accurate picture of what England looked like on a particular, in a particular set of years. Uh, And nobody had done something like that before. Um, But yes, Taxes were collected very efficiently thereafter. It's important to recognize, though, that the, that the Doomsday Book is not only for taxation, but it's also for feudal service. And so there would be an indication of these people owed so much so that it could provide two bowmen, or so much in order to have three knights. So it's, it's uh, the life of the Saxons under the Normans, particularly in the early years, wasn't great. Thank you very much, Professor. My pleasure. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.